Today, we'll be talking about machine learning, focused on collaboration rather than competition. Deep reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning that combines reinforcement, so learning by trial and error, with deep learning, which allows an AI or robotic system to make decisions based on data without human input. Recent work in deep reinforcement learning has actually mostly focused on gaming and has produced some superhuman policies for competitive games. However, rather than being competitive, most robotics applications for use in real-world settings need to be able to coordinate and cooperate with others. Hi, uh, welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself for us, please? Great, so thanks for having me here. My name is Jacob Forster. And I recently started as an associate professor at the University of Oxford. And I've been doing multi-agent reinforcement learning from before it was cool. <laughs> and so, so based in, the, in a nutshell, I, I started in my PhD asking questions such as, how can we train agents that can learn to cooperate and communicate with each other? And that has then evolved in an entire research agenda around multi-agent learning and branched into other areas of machine learning. Have you uh, always seen yourself sort of doing this kind of work? Were you always fascinated about like, uh, either like computer science or, or learning or anything like that? So the, the background is a bit more complicated. I was always fascinated by the question of intelligence. And for a long time, I saw myself going into a PhD in either, either theoretical neuroscience or experimental neuroscience even. So if you look back at my Google Scholar, you'll find that my first publications aren't in computer science, let alone multi agent learning. They're both in the area of, of neuroscience. And what happened is that during the application for my PhDs in 2015, I then was looking at the landscape and realized that uh, machine learning was looking very, very promising. And that basically led me to wonder if in the next 20, 30 years, maybe a different road to understanding intelligence would open up, which is to recreate intelligence rather than trying to understand the biological intelligence. You specifically work a lot in uh, collaboration rather than competition. Why do you think collaboration is so important for learning? Or why is learning something good for collaboration? Yeah, so I think my original interest in multi-age learning stems back from the idea that I've, I have really regard language and our ability to communicate with each other as one of the, not just core achievements of, of humanity, but also as being almost indistinguishable from human level intelligence. And there's, there, there's to me a very clear connection between our ability to communicate with each other and collaborate with each other and our level of intelligence that we have. Indeed, in my first papers, then were in the area of learn, agents that learn to communicate. That's really how this entire area of deep multi agent learning got started by thinking about communication protocols. So that's sort of like on the inspirational side, on the foundation side. However, it's obviously also very, very important from a practical point of view that we have AI systems robots or programs that can cooperate with humans. And, you know, I don't really want to have more AI systems that can beat the beat humans at their favorite two players do some game, because that's going to make the humans feel miserable. But what I'd like to have is systems that can coordinate and cooperate smoothly with other agents. You focus mostly on those other agents. Those are humans, those are robots, those could be anything, right? So when they're communicating, how do you see it going for collaboration? Is it is it communication versus collaboration or can communication be part of that collaboration? Um, how sort of, how do you like sort of handle the, those two things? Yeah. So there's a, there's an interesting, you know, communication is important and, and having clarity on what terms mean is an extraordinarily important, uh, yeah. starting point for, for having a conversation with someone. So I use the terms quite specifically. So I mean, coordination when there are various, when it's a fully cooperative setting, in which agents have to try and coordinate their strategies and there could be a coordination failure. So for example, it's a fully cooperative game, but you and me have to pick the same out of 10 levers, otherwise we fail. That's a coordination challenge. Then I use cooperation when the challenge isn't just to coordinate with each other, but when we also have to first discover common ground, things like the iterated prisoner's dilemma. Mm -hmm. And then you can put everything if you want under the umbrella of collaboration, which requires agents both to coordinate and to cooperate with each other. And in that setting, you could, you can now imagine that language could be very important, both for coordinating, for agreeing on which policies will be played at test time, but also for doing things like negotiation in a cooperation setting, right? So for example, in the iterated prisoner's dilemma, we don't normally assume a cheap talk channel, but there's an interesting question. What happens 
if agents can actually communicate with each other. And in reality, humans don't usually just act repeatedly, but instead we have conversations with others and we, we try and negotiate, people try to threaten others in order to try and understand which equilibrium will be selected in these, in these complex multifaceted. If you're trying to take this and apply it to something like robotics, do you see it being as uh, you're going to have those communication side channels and you're going to be approaching the problem from multiple ways and how does collaboration look when you're applying it to robotics rather than just multi-agent systems? Yeah, that's, that's a great, that, that's a great question. I think one of the, you know, sort of major topics of my work recently has been to think about where are the application areas of this? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like a problem thing that is so broad that in principle, everything falls under multi-agent learning. Almost every system has at least, you know, the AI agent and the human user, mm -hmm. but it's unclear that every system should be framed in this context. So for example, if you're designing a cell phone, uh, you know, a smartphone, it might not be useful to think of that system as a, being a multi-agent setting that contains the phone and the user. Instead, probably thinking of this as a, you know, an engineering problem where you have design specifications and so on is a much better way of phrasing this problem. Mm. Okay. So this, this leaves us with a, with a question here. If, if you think about robotics, what are the prime application areas where really this abstraction of agency and of multi-agent systems is going to help you? And something that's clear is it's in settings where it's easy to specify the task that's being accomplished, then it is to specify the open policy. Right? So this is in settings where you imagine that the robot and the human together have to carry out some somewhat complicated task, such that hard coding the robotic behavior for every possible state of the world is difficult, but it is possible to specify a task in a simulator or in, in, in some form of learning environment. And at that point, I, would, I, I can hope that doing multi-agent learning is going to let me find policies that are near optimal and are good at coordinating with a human, why it would be very difficult to hand specify those policies. And you can think of our games that we use in practice, like Hanabi or like other benchmarks, as being proxies for those settings. Those environments are easy to specify, but they're still, it's still difficult to find upfront policies or near upfront policies in them. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for, settings where the task is easy to specify, easy to simulate, but difficult for us to write down upfront policies. Uh, you mentioned Hanabi there. Some of the people listening might not know what that is as a game, but also you've, in one of your recent papers, you, you, you sort of uh, say it's like the next grand challenge, right? Uh, or sort mm -hmm. of has been or is. And uh, why Hanabi? What, what is Hanabi? Why, why is this uh, a grand challenge? So this goes back to some extent to the, what I said a few minutes ago, which is I don't want AI agents that make humans feel miserable by beating them at two players or some games. We've gotten plenty good at this. You know, we now have superhuman performance from, from uh, Tabla Rasa in, in Go, in poker, in chess. And ultimately, the theory is quite far developed. Methods are quite far developed. We're really good at beating humans in games. But what I'm looking for is AI systems, be it robotic or otherwise, that can help and support humans, can work with humans, collaborate and coordinate and communicate with humans. Mm -hmm. And it so turned out that there weren't large scale benchmarks for letting us test those abilities in complex, partially observable, fully cooperative settings. So the exact polar opposite of two players or some is a fully cooperative setting. And in particular, if you think about human eye coordination, because the reward function and other factors about the human will be unknown, it's by definition partially observable. And it's fully cooperative because we're trying to maximize the reward for the human. We have an AI agent that is helping, helping a human. And that's often called the deck pom dp the decentralized partial observable market decision process. And it so turned out that there weren't really any benchmarks in that area that were suitable for testing those ideas. And Hanabi is fantastic. Let me explain this game briefly. Because it's a card game with a huge amount of partial observability. Because each player holds their cards away from themselves. So I don't have a deck here right now, unfortunately, but what happens is that I'd be rather than looking at your cards, you're holding your cards open to the other players, but I myself can't see them. And therefore to figure out what to do as a next move, or to how, how we can jointly accomplish our task, which is building these stacks of cards, much like Solitaire, I have to interpret the actions of other players in my team. And they have to think about how they can expect me to understand their actions. And it's exactly this aspect of theory of mind, trying to communicate with others, given the limited amount of pre-agreed conventions and trying to understand 
how our actions will be interpreted given the context of the game that's known to everybody else. That makes an so fascinating to humans. It's a game if you ever recommend it to somebody and they play it, they'll probably, probably recommend it to five more people. And those people will also love the game. Mm. And those are exactly the challenges that our computer programs, our learning algorithms, currently are really, really bad at. So from that point of view, Hanabi was really sort of filling in that blind spot of fully cooperative, partially observable benchmarks. For Hanabi, you're not seeing your own cards, you're seeing the other people's cards, so you really are sort of having to reason about what they're trying to tell you. It's fully collaborative, so there's no sort of agents trying to hurt the system, right? There, there, mm -hmm. There's nobody trying to give you bad information. Um, but sometimes it's like when you play a game, you could maybe be teamed with somebody that like you just really don't mix well with. Do you think at all about like agents that are maybe better suited to playing on like a set of teams? Is that sort of the goal for it? Or uh, is it just to like optimize the team as the whole to perform well? You, you touched on a lot of very important points here. If we look at the history of the Hanavi, the work being done in Hanavi, which goes back to this Hanavi challenge paper really in terms of the, the learning algorithms on the learning side. They were hand-coded methods before. The first papers, all of them were in a specific problem setting, which is maximizing the team reward of a specific team. And I refer to that as the self-play setting, because really this is sort of like what the self-play algorithm in a fully corporate setting is going to maximize, the performance of that team when being put together. The challenge with this or the downside is that if you take any of these self-play policies, and self-play for those that might not know is just when you're in reinforcement learning, you're playing against yourself to then optimize the reward. Exactly. So basically you're maximizing, you know, imagine you have weight sharing, where all the policies are being shared or not, it doesn't even matter, but fundamentally you're optimizing one team of agents over a large period of training, such that this team of agent maximizes the total score in Hanami. And you, you know, we've really moved that needle up from, I think when I started working on this, it was around. 17 or like the, the learning ages were at 14 points, something like this. And we very soon exceeded 24. And then we got close to, you know, the, the, we have the very best bots nowadays are learning agents, including then doing search on top of these. But the challenge with these agents is that if you ever try and pair them with a different agent at test time, rather than with the, with the exact team that they were trained in, they will fail, fail catastrophically. To an extent that even if you take the same state of the art learning algorithm, and you run it five times in the row independently, and you mix and match those teams, the same agents from the same algorithm from different training runs on independent different uh, random initializations will be unable to coordinate with each other. They will fail catastrophically at test time. Mm. And this to me opened a big question, which is if we're working towards coordinating with humans, will be a good intermediate goalpost. One where I wouldn't have to rely on human evaluation and human testing at every time step in my development cycle. A research scientist can have a proxy setting, so to say, that's a good step towards human eye coordination, but does not the challenges of reproducibility, of recruitment, of ethical concerns, and so on of human testing. Mm -hmm. And what we've converged upon is a zero shot coordination setting. And what this means is trying to find learning algorithms now that if they're being run independently, on the same problem setting, produce consistent results across independent runs. Mm. Because clearly, if you can't even coordinate with yourself, you can't expect to coordinate with a human test. And so is this looking at diversity of the agents? You're trying to like just be able to have them perform for- I can, I can speak to that briefly. So is this, you know, you ask is looking at diversity and yes, in general, what this entails is the meta convention. So for, you know, to solve zero shot coordination, what you need is, an algorithm that can introduce a convention within the episode, because episodes are temporally extended, and adapt to those conventions as well, right? So, you know, if you think about a very simple setting where you and I have to pick the same out of 10 levers, but we have 10 time steps, and the number of times we pick the same lever is our final reward. Clearly, so like a meta convention here is I'm going to pick an arbitrary lever early on, and then I'm going to randomize 50-50, mm -hmm. and then that lever that we convert from becomes the convention, and then we stick to it. Right. And that's the optimal zero shot coordination policy, ZSC. Whereas if you think about optimal self play policies, those policies can pick an arbitrary lever in the first step, take a second arbitrary lever, a different one in the, in the second step, and so on. Mm. Right. And those obviously will fail with the human because there's no regularity. There's no need to be regular. Mm. And that highlights the difference between sort of like ad hoc team play and playing the best yeah. response to a pool and this notion of zero shot coordination, which I 
which I now believe is like a really, really important front, front, uh, frontier for multilateral learning. And so this zero shot coordination, it, that's when, when you're not able to coordinate beforehand, right? You can agree on the training algorithm in the abstract. You and me get to agree on a training algorithm, but we don't know the problem setting yet. Then we have to implement this training algorithm independently. We have to train it, produce half a team each from this algorithm, and then our teams get matched together on the test at, at test time. And we're trying to find an algorithm that allows us to have a high score at test time between these independently trained agents. And as a researcher, obviously, this, this, is, this is a grand challenge because basically everything that we have so far will fail. So this is a big open problem. Yeah. But at least now it's well defined. Because yeah. before the question of how do you measure coordination? Well, it depends on the pool you're measuring with and you know humans are complicated. Now we have a very clean problem setting that people can actually work on do machine learning in when thinking about coordination. Do you see zero shot coordination being fairly realistic to actual applications? Like, does this show up in the real world? Yes, I mean, a simple example is if you have a, a cooperative task, robots have to be trained as a team and it's partially observable. What any training algorithm is going to do is that these robots will develop secretive conventions, cryptic conventions for exchanging information. So if two robots can observe each other's actions, they will, through the joint training, coexist in the same environment, they will learn to communicate by doing weird movements with their hands that are informative only to those partners being trained with. Now, if you substitute a human into that same team, the human is going to be extremely confused about the scripting movement, right? So imagine if I sat here in the podcast and rather than talking to you using English language or approximation thereof, I was making weird uh, motions yeah. to you, right? That would be a coordination failure because it would be very difficult to communicate with me. And yet this is exactly what all our like learning algorithms, see of the learning algorithms, are going to do and are doing in these uh, deck pom DPs, in these advanced partial zero map decision processes. By thinking about zero short coordination, we've come up with a new method that addresses this off belief learning. Off belief learning prevents agents from exchanging information through their actions. They just can't do it. They can play optimally otherwise, and they can use grounded information channels. So, you know, if you open a door and I can see that there's a fridge in the room, I can still see there's a fridge, but you can't communicate with this to me. Through your, through your actions. You have to go and open the door and I have to see it myself. Hmm. So this came out of thinking about zero-shot coordination, but it's obviously hugely relevant for every single problem setting that is not two players or some, even a general sum setting, agents could communicate with each other and can be applied on top of any multi-agent learning environment of your choice. So for example, you can imagine that a self driving cars and simulator, if trained together using reinforcement learning, would also develop these weird conventions. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my cars to be gossiping, gossiping about me yeah. <laughs> by creating weird little motions with their wheels. Yeah. Yeah. And also, again, this would obviously lead to coordination failure at, at test time if this was happening. Right? I can give you another example, which is if you train agents, you know, this is very common. You're on the sidewalk and you're walking around and you're basically trying to avoid another agent on the sidewalk. Humans do this little dance where they would little. randomize, you know, you basically randomize, you slow down. Self-play agents don't need to run devices to slow down because they know exactly which side to pick. Okay, but also in, on the contrary, if you did then put self-play agents together, they would obviously crash against each other because there's no need to avoid each other because they know that, you know, they make strong assumptions about the, the expected behavior of other agents. Mm. So this is very, very common in any setting where you don't have the time to agree exactly on policies at zero-shot coordination. And even in future coordination, we have a lot of regularity because we can't really pre-agree for every action in every possible state of the world. You're trying to like ground them away from choosing just like arbitrary things. I'm trying to get to sort of these, these robust coordination strategies that um, don't make unrealistic assumptions about the common knowledge between the two parties or the different parties in the problem setting. Mm -hmm. And in particular, in social coordination, you can argue, you know, in the, in the clearest form, there is no common knowledge apart from the problem setting itself. The problem setting is common knowledge, but otherwise you and I can't agree on anything, right? And what this means is if, you know, you and me have 10 levers to, 10 levers to pick from, there's no way to break the ties between those 10 levers. Self-play algorithms will always break the ties arbitrarily, right? But instead, if you're doing social coordination, you know, we shouldn't try and guess for the same, even because we can't, instead we should maybe take the bailout action, which only gives us half the reward.
but that's preferable to playing a one in 10 chance. How do you see this when it's trying to like scale in the space of like actions? It, it's, it sounds like to me like a pretty large space to search. I, I think there's, you know, at, at a high level, I think there's two, there's two answers to this. One of them is we don't really know what the right way, or if there's a right way to think about coordination in the context of high dimensional inputs and high dimensional actions. It might be that this kind of high level reasoning I'm describing to think about the structure of the problem setting, think about the symmetries of the problem setting, think about the common knowledge, the beliefs and so on, that this happens in a more abstracted version of the game or of the world. It's, it's unclear to me at this point, if there is going to be a way to have an end to end algorithm that is able to exploit common knowledge and is able to coordinate from pixels yeah. into joint movement. It's conceivable in my mind that we'll have abstractions, that we'll deal with perception to get a semantic state that's relatively high level. And then we have skills or other macro actions that we can execute that get then get translated into hand motions or joint motions mm. in general. And at that point, you know, you'd have a temporal abstraction because you're going to, these things attempt to extend it and you have a semantic abstraction of the world. And then I think in that space, we can do these kind of multi-age learning things again. That space state is still very large, but at least it has a lot more structure now, right? And we don't need to be, we obviously can't search it because we're doing, we're working with partially observable settings. So doing search in these, in these settings is typically intractable. So we'll have to rely heavily on learning methods that scale to these very large partially observable fully, fully cooperative settings. Mm -hmm. For robotics, you're saying there's this hierarchy, right? Maybe at the low level, you'd be doing the sensor and the control. And then at some point there's this decision over how they're going to collaborate. If you're trying to do this and a big area right now is explainability and interpretability. And mm -hmm. so how does that play in here when you are trying to collaborate uh, potentially mm -hmm. with a human, you've got a robot in the loop, there's like sort of this hierarchy of different decisions. Yeah. And, and then there's like this little collaboration area. How do you see explainability and interpretability, interpretability playing a role here? I, I think this is a byproduct mm -hmm. of addressing zero-shot coordination is to have interpretable, simple policies. Because if you think about it, if I'm to coordinate within an episode, I have to strictly limit the search space of policies I consider to a point where I can expect the other party to be able to identify what policy I'm playing and adapt to it. So currently interpretability and simplicity are sort of weird add-ons and reinforcement learning because by the per se, there's no need for these. But if you take zero-shot coordination as a problem setting seriously, then those fall out of trying to do machine learning in the setting. Because by definition, I can only expect to adapt yeah. to a small, space, a small space and simple space of policies. Now that doesn't mean that we found the correct methods for this yet, because as I said, ZSC is an open problem. But at least it gives us a principled way to approach this, which is if you want to solve ZSC, we have to find abstractions. We have to find a way of simplifying our search space of our policies. And then interpretability is going to fall out of that formalism very naturally, because I can only expect to coordinate with someone else if I can understand the policy they're playing quickly within the episode. Right. And I think this is one of the great, you know, the really interesting frontiers right now for research, which is how do we find that abstraction? If you give me a problem setting, how can I develop an algorithm that finds that smaller representation, that smaller abstract space, which allows me to turn what looks like one sequential game into an iterated version of self-similar types of situations in abstract space. Mm. So rather than having a single game of an algorithm that takes 65 time steps, where each time step is different because I have a different history at every time step. So there's never any way that you, make it, you and I can coordinate because who knows, just because I did X at time step T doesn't mean I'll do something similar at T plus one because I have different histories. Instead, what we're looking for is now algorithms that can identify the underlying structure in the abstract, in which case the kind of situations you go through are self-similar. Things like hinting for playable cards, discarding cards that aren't playable, those abstract notions happen over and over again in the game. And then you can infer that, you know, because I hinted for the playable card using rank at time step five, I'll probably do the same again later in the game. 
right? And that gives you explainability, reliability, the other, the other. Yeah. All this was very naturally out of thinking about coordination in this framework. And then that also probably gives you some generalizability, which is also a, a large part of it. Is there another game on the horizon after Hanabi? That's a good question. I mean, f f for a start, there are about 50 variants of Hanabi that we haven't yet, <laughs> that we haven't yet fully explored so this. You know, <laughs> there's, there's many, many variations of the game. I don't know if it's 50 or, or 20 or hundred. And they also keep, keep more variations come. And, you know, what we discussed before is we, we, we like to have an algorithm that is robust to a broad range of different human skill levels, different play styles, yada, 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 all of this without requiring a human data training time, right? So I'm really, I'm looking for algorithms that, so like the master algorithm of coordination here, that can really adapt to any reasonable policy at test time, right? That's the mean I want to stay to games now. I think ideally I'd like to move towards settings that are a bit closer, practically speaking, to the kind of practical applications I, I envision down the road. Mm. So for example, a simulator that simulates the high level decision-making in traffic that replicates the socially dense interactions that happen in a cross, at a, at a cross section in, in, a, in a city where you have not just a number of different cars, but you have obstructions, you have pedestrians, you have cyclists, and it matters who can see what and what they know that I know and what they think I think is going to happen next. Typical theory of mind. Typically, typical theory of mind, I think, matters a lot in traffic, but we don't have good multi-agent simulators for this yet. So this is one of the things I'm actively working on, which is to try and turn, develop a benchmark that is multi-agent learning, but one step closer to, to applications than Hanabi is. Because Hanabi is a little bit, a little bit removed yeah. from, from real applications. As you choose these challenges to work on, uh, I know part of the goal is to not have to have humans all the time for testing because that's difficult to do. But um, when you are thinking about how to evaluate whether something works well with a human, um, probably more than just do we get a good score, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to have a robot work with a human, do you think about things like does the human like trust the, the learning agent? Does the human, you know, feel good playing with the the agent or do you look just at is it scoring higher than the other bot that we played i think ultimately that's a design decision well, what would we like mm -hmm. you know if if the task is to do well in the in, in the game or in the in the task then i don't think we have to care about anything else yeah. if there's if there's other desiderata then of course we should take those into consideration there was a great paper recently, a paper from MIT, where they looked at Hanabi bots, Hanabi gameplay, and they found that our other play bot from a year and a half ago, when evaluated with humans, scored okay, but the humans didn't like or didn't trust it. Mm. What's interesting with this is that this bot really is, is quite old. And even at the time of their studies, I believe our of belief learning bots were already around. So it would be fantastic for someone to just go and redo all the work that they did with the belief learning work, because those parts are a lot more human playable and a lot more friendly. What's interesting is that our belief learning didn't come out of human testing. It came out of trying to do zero shot coordination. And it just so turns out that the points that come out of zero shot coordination work really well with humans. And I believe if we actually develop sort of like a more master algorithm that does coordinate well, then human trust in some will come out of it naturally speaking. Because humans trust things that they understand, that are predictable, but those are also direct requirements for coordination in the first place. There isn't really a great difference from being able to coordinate broadly and being able to work with a human, because humans have found some form of meta convention that they can use to coordinate with each other in a broad variety of problem settings. And that involves predictability and involves um, understandability, yada, yada, yada. Right. So again, I think those problems, they are relevant right now because we don't have good methods as we develop better methods. I suspect that just working towards the score means we're going to do just fine if that is the primary goal, primary goal in the setting. Yeah. Obviously, if the goal is to involve the human or teach the human or whatever, then we have to change problem setting. You mentioned a, a bit about the human's opinion of robots and, and something else that I, when I was looking into the, uh, it, talking to you for this, uh, podcast episode was, uh, you have, uh, uh, contributed to the conversation on like arming drones. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that because it also applies uh, to robotics and um, and sort of why 
Uh, why are you interested in this, but also why now? Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. So, so maybe just for background, some of the work we've done here at Oxford and in other places, I do my PhD in after, has been about this sort of like the team team setting of coordinating a group of agents to work well together in part of observability, right? And it doesn't take a huge amount of creativity to imagine that this could be useful for coordinating a swarm of drones. Yeah. And there's a big, I think in terms of technological development, we're at a pivot point right now, whereby the barrier between drones in the sky that are remote controlled by a human and fully autonomous weapons is a software update mm. in the control center. And it's not just a software update, it's a software update where all the components for building the control circuitry are now available open source to anyone in the world. Because by definition, we've gotten, you know, we, we can, the remote control weapon can receive signals from the control center and can send perception information back to the control center. That is all the information that the control algorithm in the control center would need to replace the human and turn this remote control weapon into a fully autonomous weapon. Now, until 15, 20 years ago, while this was already true, it was really, really hard to replace a human from the perception and control perspective. Now, we all know that in the last 15 years, we've gone through a revolution, first on the computer vision side, which has taken out the perception part and made that part somewhat trivial if you're willing to take errors into account, if you're willing to make some mistakes. And then the control part is getting addressed as we speak with deep reinforcement learning. And then personally, I don't think it would stop at one drone. It would very, very quickly go towards swarms, swarms of drones that are being remote controlled and that, that can coordinate the other. And that's where my work comes in. And that is not what I want my work to be, my legacy to be. I do not want to be part of the scientific community that helped push humanity into a fatal arms race. That's not my legacy. And when this all came together, when I realized what was happening, how close we were to this, to this arms race really being at a point of no return, that's when we became sort of like an advocate to speak against the arming of drones. And there's a personal component here, which is that Germany is one of the last um, countries in the world in, 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 well, in, like, in a certain socioeconomic framework that hasn't armed, armed the drones at all. And I think we need people who can really be pushing to, against the automation of warfare and arming drones is to me, sort of like the entry drug into that process. And I don't think this is yet well understood how small the barrier of entry is once you have, once you have remote control weapons to making them autonomous. There are already instances where it's unclear if a drone strike was carried out autonomously or controlled by a human. Because ultimately that would require you to understand the software that is running inside the control center. Mm -hmm. That definitely rings true. And I, I, you said you don't want like, that to be your legacy sort of. So. Uh, do you have any advice for researchers or engineers trying to advance learning uh, without making the world worse, really? Um, like, uh, how do you try to develop things and advance science, you know, push that boundary uh, without, you know, you, you may be working on fighting wildfires or fighting or like search and rescue. And then quickly that could then just be, you know, like you slap a label over it and it changes to something completely different like arming drones or something like that like how do we try to be better about this yeah i think there's there's, there's at least two answers w one of the answers is that if we're working on specific applications rather than on foundations then i think there's always a bit of a mitigation already happening here right if you're working on a specific adaptation of the general computer learning computer vision algorithm to the discovery of cancer cells, which of cancer cells, then it's less likely that those specific adaptations will also be useful in a very, very broadly different, very, very different context. So I think this really says, you know, working on specific useful problem instances might be the safer route to go, right? And this applies both to things like computer vision, but also to reinforcement learning. If we're working on a specific useful problem instance and making practical changes there, or even applying, you know, DeepMind's work on protein folding, right? 
those ideas I think are less likely to transfer to something completely different because they're quite specific to what sort of actually instances of actual problems rather than rather than sort of saying we're trying to learn solve more data learning. Right? So one instance is work on specific problems. The other instances become active. The other answers become active. Organize, talk to people. And I was shocked how easy it is. How easy it is to start having a voice in the debate as a scientist. To me, this was shocking. So we wrote a couple of open lectures. And I think that the first step is just finding like-minded people, talking about the topic with others. And after that, we just started writing open letters. We proposed a social at ICLR that was, that was accepted, where we had people debate the topic, where we had people come in, connecting with like-minded people. So there's the killer robot campaign that's specifically targeting autonomous weapons, not drones in general. And they have a lot of, you know, they're always happy to have a conversation. But also just make your opinion heard. So just write an open letter, send it to your politicians, reach out to people, organize. And that process, I think, is started to some extent, but we need a lot more of this in the scientific community. community. Because if we're not aware of, what we're, of if we're not thinking about what the consequences are, who is going to think about it, right? And then lastly, there's something that we're planning to do that we haven't done yet, which is to set up a sort of a new open source license that directly tries to prevent abuse of scientific knowledge of algorithms and ideas for military purposes and you know hopefully soon it will be quite standard to see machine learning papers making the declaration that this is to be used for the good of humanity not for military purposes where do you see the next few years like for you what are you what are you focused on what are you excited about what are you interested in working on yeah i i still think that sort of our human ability to communicate and cooperate is one of the most fascinating human accomplishments. Hmm. And I, I'd love to understand the foundations of that from an algorithmic learning point of view. How can we build systems that have those same abilities? And the reason I think this is fascinating is A, the practical applications of having systems that can work well with humans and cooperate and coordinate and whatnot, but also because I think it will teach us something foundational about who we are as humans. What is intelligence? What does it actually mean to, be, to perceive or to believe? What does it mean to understand someone? Where does language come from? These are a lot of big questions. And I think maybe five years is a bit, is, is a bit ambitious, but in the long run, we will see AI agents that have those abilities and that we can probe, right? We can talk to these agents, we can communicate with them, we can also inspect every single activation and every single parameter in the neural network. And I think at that point, we'll have learned something fundamental about what it means to be human, what it means to interact with others, and what it means to be intelligent. So that's sort of like the very, very long term. And hopefully in the meantime, we'll make progress on practical problems. We'll address some of the big foundational questions, which is, you know, how do I account for the learning of other learning agents in the same environment, right? How can agents learn to negotiate with each other, understanding to find common, common interest with others, and hopefully prevent some of the most dire consequences that could come out of doing all of this without thinking about the long-term implications and the potential downsides. That's, that was a great summary. Uh, it, it's been fantastic talking to you. Um, uh, thank you for coming on, taking the time out of your day to do this. Thank you for having me. It's been, it's been great to be here. And that's the end of today's podcast. As always, go to robohub.org forward slash podcast for more. And if you enjoy our episodes and would like to support our small team of international volunteers, then please check out our Patreon campaign, where you can donate as little as a dollar a month to help us keep going. Find out more on our website at robohub.org. We'll be back again in two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye. Collaboration with Robohub, the podcast for news and views on robotics. Mm -hmm.